All right, well, it's good to be with you for our discipleship video. We are continuing our study on the Gospel of Mark, and this week we are looking at Mark chapter 6, verse 6 through chapter 8, verse 21. So there's a number of stories in there that we're not going to capture all of them today. In fact, we're not even going to get out of chapter 6 in our video today, but I'll leave you some time on the back end to have some conversation about any of the stories and parts of Scripture that stood out to you. Well, we're going to focus uh, first in here in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 6, and look at verses 6 through 13 and talk just a little bit about that. But we see that right now Jesus' ministry has been growing immensely. His popularity has skyrocketed among the people. And so as Jesus' ministry thrives, probably at its, at its height right here in March, Mark, Mark chapter 6, uh, we see that Jesus turns his attention to his disciples. Jesus has been doing ministry for a while. Here, he's been the active agent in ministry. But here, for the first time, Jesus turns to his disciples and he begins to send them out. You know, first, he calls them unto himself, and now he sends them out. And let's read verses 6 through 13. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for your journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So what we see here in Mark chapter 6 is that Jesus' disciples now become an extension of his ministry. They're not just observers along for the ride or those given front row seats to Jesus' amazing ministry. Here in Mark chapter 6, for the first time, they become an active extension of what Jesus is doing. You know, Jesus sends them out, and what he does is he sends them to go and do the very things that they have seen Jesus himself do. You know, this is why our definition of what it means to be a disciple is to become like Jesus so that we will naturally do what Jesus does. And, and so this is what we see the disciples doing. They're, they're growing in Christ's character and values. They're learning this as they're watching him, but then they get involved. They go out, they, they have authority over impure spirits. They go out preaching the very same message that they've heard Jesus preached. Uh, preach to the people, and so uh, we see them healing as Jesus healed. Um, and so we see the disciples kind of take the step into becoming participants in Jesus's ministry, imitating him in the things that they have seen him do. Uh, so for our first exercise as a group, I, I want you to spend a little bit of time kind of thinking through the things that we have seen Jesus do in Mark's gospel thus far. Hopefully we've read through eight chapters of Mark by this point. And so what are some of the things that you have seen Jesus do in his ministry thus far in Mark? Now, once you've identified a few of those things, I want you to ask this question. What do the things that Jesus did back then say about what we should be doing now? How does Jesus' ministry back then inform our ministry today? I want you to stop the video and spend some time discussing that amongst yourselves. As we come back, you know, it's kind of my experience that oftentimes we struggle and really connecting the ministry that Jesus did back then to the ministry that we are to do today. And sometimes that's because we don't know what to do with some of the things that Jesus did. And other times we just don't feel equipped to be able to do the things that he did. And so we struggle with that sometimes. Uh, on, 
And I think on some level as, as disciples today, um, we feel like our lack of competence uh, often disqualifies us from service. And, and we use that sometimes as an excuse to not be involved in doing the things that Jesus did. Well, I, I can't do them. That's kind of what we tell ourselves. Um, so I want us to, to do an exercise here. I want us to think back to the beginning of Mark, to the, the calling of the disciples. I want us to remember who Jesus chose to follow him and ultimately become extensions of his ministry. If you think back to that, you remember that Jesus didn't go to recruit his disciples from synagogues or seminaries. He didn't go to the religious professionals. In fact, he clearly avoided them. Um, in fact, Jesus went to the fishing docks. He chose fishermen that had no power or authority in the ancient world. He chose tax collectors whom everybody despised. You, Jesus chose ordinary people, people much like you and me, to follow him and, and not only become extensions of his ministry, to become those who will inherit fully his ministry and to go about changing the world. These are the people that Jesus chose. He chose you and me to be a part of this work. You know, Jesus chose the, the least expected to go out and change the world. And, and you've probably heard it said that Jesus chose, chose ordinary people to go out and do extraordinary things. This is certainly what we see of the disciples in, here in the Gospels. And so we know that the excuse of not being qualified doesn't fly in the kingdom of God. It just doesn't. Because it's not about whether or not we are, are qualified or whether or not we feel equipped. And this leads us to a kingdom principle that I think every disciple needs to wrestle with. And so I want us to think about, I want you to listen to this because we're going to talk about it in just a moment. Um, so listen to this kingdom principle. Our effectiveness doesn't come from our skills that we possess, but from the power with which we are supplied. You know, our fruitfulness, let me say it in another way, our fruitfulness for the kingdom doesn't depend on how good we are. It depends upon the power that God gives us. That's what fruitfulness is dependent upon. Not you and I and what we bring to the table, but instead the power with which God gives to us. So I want you to talk about that statement. And not only do I want you to talk about that kind of kingdom principle, about that idea that our effectiveness um, doesn't come from the skills we possess, but the power with which we are supplied by God. I want you all to talk about that, but I also want you to talk about the implications of that for the ministry to which we're called. What does that mean for what God is calling you and I to today? And stop the video and have some discussion. All right, as we come back, we're, we're moving a few verses ahead to the feeding of the 5,000. And what we'll see here at this story is that Jesus once again calls his disciples to do the impossible. And the people had come from all around to hear Jesus and see Jesus and to bring their sick to Jesus. And he has compassion upon them. He begins to heal. Uh, and it's late in the day and the people are hungry. And the disciples feel like they're doing a good thing when they say to Jesus, you know, it's probably time to dismiss them and let them go to the villages and buy some food for themselves. And, and Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, you give them something to eat. You do it. Uh, and, and the question and, and how they respond to this is going to say a lot about really who uh, they are. And when you look at their response, you see that immediately the first thing that comes to mind when they're given this charge to feed the 5,000 plus people who are there is they see their limitations. They see the immense need in front of them and they see what little resources they have. They see their limitations 
and it stops them in their tracks. They say, you, but this can take a year and a half's wages. Are we supposed to be responsible for that tab? Is that what you're expecting of us, Jesus? Um, they see those limitations and and this is just off the heels of these of the 12 being sent out with so little and seeing God do so much through them with, with very little in their possession. And once again, they fall back immediately upon what resources they have in and of themselves. We're so quick to do that, aren't we? You know, Jesus ends up asking them the question, how many loaves do you have? It's a question that he asked them and this is where we discover that this is really a test of faith, is what it is. Uh, and the test is really this, it's, will their perceived limitations keep them from putting what they have in Jesus' hands? Will they look at the need and look at what they have and say, it's, you can't do anything, this is going to do nothing to meet this need, therefore I'll just hold on. Or... Will they take what they have and put it into Christ's hands, trusting that he is sufficient, that he can supply any need, regardless of what they're called to? It's a big question. And you know the end of the story. I mean, it's one of the most famous stories in the Gospels. But I'm wondering about you. I mean, if that was you today, standing there on that hillside, looking over the crowd there with Jesus, would you respond, frozen by the limitations that you had? Or would you trust and look to Jesus to supply the need? Today, in your ministry in life, are you stifled by your perceived limitations? Or do you look to Christ in faith, knowing that he can supply anything to which he calls you to? I want you to stop the video. I want you to share uh, some of that conversation. In fact, this is going to close the, the video out. But uh, hopefully I have a little bit of time to talk about any other stories you have from Mark chapter 6 through 8 that, that stood out to you. But I pray you're blessed. And may we as disciples continue to grow in Christ that we can begin to do the things that Jesus did. Thank you so much for joining us.